everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So yesterday we were talking about uh, how after the French and Indian War, there's this thing called the Proclamation of 1763. And for the first time in like 150 years, America had been told they can't do something by Britain in 1763. This wasn't the first time England had told them they can't do something, but it was the first time Britain actually enforces a law. Because it had been this whole concept of salutary neglect for a really long time, where as long as the colonies paid their taxes, England let them do whatever they wanted. Now, even though it's something silly like not being able to go over the Appalachian Mountains, the colonies are pretty irked about the fact that England, on the other side of the country, or on the other side of the world, is preventing the colonists from living their best life. Colonists aren't a big fan of being told what to do and then being forced to do it, regardless of the intention. So we're going to pick up there as we go through uh, uh, this unit here on revolutionary mindset. Let's go ahead and get started. So if you've heard about the American Revolution or you have any background, the fact that the argument is going to be over taxes is probably well ingrained in your brain. The whole concept of no taxation without representation. Uh, you may have heard that before. If you haven't, you're fine because I'm going to teach you all about it right here anyway. Uh, but when you hear the term no taxation without representation, the first thing you probably think of is, yeah, nobody wants taxes. That's actually not what ticked off the colonists the most. Let's go through and explain what is happening here. Okay? So, France and England had fought a war. It's called the French and Indian War here in the New World because France and the Indians had teamed up. England's going to win. Now, here's what that does. So, here on this map, uh, the yellow area is area that France owned prior to trying to take over the pink areas, all right, which was owned by the British in the Seven Years' War, or here it's going to be the, the French and Indian War is what we called it, meaning the colonists. Well, France is going to lose, and it doesn't work out well for them because not only do they not take over the colonies, they lose all their other stuff over here. They actually even have to cede some of their land uh, to Spain and Louisiana, whole nother story, but uh, France and Spain end up fighting with Napoleon, and France gets that land back later on. Anyway, uh, the, the Louisiana part here. But England has all this land, and they're like, whew, awesome. War's over, we're good to go. The problem is, all right, and, and this is what's important, The problem is this war cost a ton of money for Britain because not only were they fighting over in the New World defending the colonies who didn't care one way or other because they're just going to ship their crops off to whoever won. Not only did the colonies not care, it cost England a bunch of money to defend the colonies from being taken over by the evil French. They're also fighting the French all around the rest of the world. So it cost England a ton of money. Well, so when the war's over, England has to pay down this debt that they had incurred during this war. So they need money. How are they going to get money? Taxes. And that's where everybody got angry. It's not. The colonists had been getting ripped off since the beginning of time and they knew it and they were cool with it. The problem is, uh, since the Magna Carta, there had been a parliament in England where they have representatives in England that represent the people that live in England. The, rep the people in England didn't care about these wars because it didn't benefit them, so they convinced their representatives when they passed these taxes that the taxes didn't apply to people that actually lived in England. The only people that had to pay these taxes are colonists, like in the New World. All right? That is going to tick off the colonists because there's this whole concept of the Enlightenment that had come out. The Enlightenment is this uh, belief that there's no divine king, no nothing, that all humans are the same. And in the religious aspect of it in the New World, it is the idea that everybody is equal, this concept of equality. Yes, there is slavery that is happening at the same time. The same people that are saying all men are created equal owned slaves. Absolute hypocrisy. It's, it's just... 
So it's a thing in history. So the people that, you know, equality for everybody, own other humans. That's uh, details we'll go into uh, net hypocrisy in U.S. history. But uh, among, you know, the non-slaves, uh, white males at the time, it was this idea that everybody should be equal. And if only the colonists are the ones that are having to pay this tax, it is unfair because they're not equal because they don't have representation. So this is where the argument comes, no taxation without representation. Because the colonists don't like the fact that they have representatives and because they have representatives, they don't have to pay this tax. But over here in the new world, we do have to pay this tax and we don't have representation. Basically, the colonists feel disrespected. It's not about the taxes. They know you have to pay taxes. That's just the thing you always have to pay taxes. It's not, they're not saying we're not paying taxes. It's don't you dare disrespect me and treat me, meaning a colonist, as lesser than the people who live in England because technically we're all supposed to be British citizens. So there's this sense of disrespect. Anytime these taxes come out, it's not like, oh, I have to pay another nickel for this. It's why are we paying it and they're not? We don't have the same say, say so. We're not treated as equal. This is disrespectful. And the colonists take that disrespect, take it to heart. And the colonists are willing to fight for it because they feel like their government isn't treating them with respect. Because once again, their government is the British government. So this kind of motto right here is very much the embodiment of this time period is you can't force people to respect you but you can refuse to tolerate their disrespect. That is very much how the colonists are going to view the British here, is we ain't gonna to tolerate this disrespect. So the question is, why does no taxation without representation mean? What does that mean? And how is that different in today's society, meaning in the United States of America now? All right, uh, do we have representation? We absolutely do. And we're gonna talk about it a great deal in this course. All right, so the argument against the taxes is not the taxes themselves. It's the fact that the colonists had no say-so over it, which is something that still exists in today's society, that taxes still exist, but because we have representatives that create these taxes, it's more tolerable. So the whole no taxation without representation is not about the taxes. It's about the disrespect of the colonists having no say-so over it. All right. Answer that completely, we're moving on. So, here come the taxes and the colonies are ticked about it. And they're mad, once again, because it's disrespect, they have no say so over this. They're being told by this tyrannical regime is how they're starting to uh, view King George in England at the time, because they have no say so. They have no way of voicing their displeasure at this because they have no representatives in parliament. So they get grumpy. So. The first one that is going to get passed is a sugar act. It's a tax on sugar. Now, it should be noted that when England's passing this, they're like kind of oblivious that the colonists are super angry about it because they're not, there's nobody talks to them. So they learn real quick that the colonists are gonna be weird about this because when they pass the sugar act, which puts the tax on sugar, the colonists just stop buying sugar. They're like, nope, if it's something that you don't have to have, the colonists just stop buying it. So yeah, the stuff probably didn't taste very good, but that's fine. Unless you need it, you didn't buy it. That was the very first way of protesting these taxes is we're not gonna pay them because we ain't gonna buy the stuff. So England's like, oh, all right. They wanna be squirrely about it. So after the Sugar Act, it becomes pretty obvious that the colonies are going to fight against this. So, the second thing that they do, and it's just all of these things, it's kind of playing gotcha games with the colonists, and the colonists know it. And after 150 years of being left alone, these little games are irritating to the colonists. Because the next thing that the uh, British government is going to pass on the colonists is something called a currency act. So this hadn't been a problem yet, but they're trying to stay like one step ahead of like what they think the dumb things the colonists are trying to do is they say, hey, you can't use any colonial money 
like this is why I have the, the American dollar disappeared. This didn't exist at the time, obviously, but it's we, we recognize it today. Uh, that you can't use any colonial or American money. You have to use the British money, like our money. Because what they don't want to do is have these taxes and then the colonists go print off a whole bunch of worthless like monopoly money and be like, here's we're paying our taxes, which the money's not actually based on anything. So they clarified, hey, by the way, any of these taxes have to be paid with like actual real money from Britain. You can't make up your own fake money and pay it. This Otherwise, it, it, it's worthless to the British. These little gotcha games, again, it's all about respect. And the colonists are getting grumpier and grumpier over this respect. Just like a rambunctious teenager playing gotcha games and then the parents win doesn't make you very happy. And that is why the Stamp Act infuriated the colonists. Because you couldn't boycott this, you couldn't ignore this one. Britain won. And the colonists are furious over this tax. All right, it literally just says anytime you buy anything with paper, you have to pay like a little extra tax uh, to get a stamp to stick on it. That was it. Uh, and it, it, it depends. I, I always like to try to show the stamp one way or other. Sometimes it was almost like a sticky stamp. Sometimes it was like a chunk stamp. Uh, it, it depended on what region you were in. However, so anytime you buy a newspaper, and keep in mind. There wasn't no internet or anything like that. So anytime you bought anything, even a receipt, you bought land, you bought anything had to have paper that goes along with it. The paper, any legal document, newspaper, nothing. Once you bought it, you had to have a stamp. If it was a legal document and you didn't have a stamp, it didn't matter. So if you bought land and you didn't put a stamp on it, you didn't actually even own the land. And the stamp, it wasn't that much. These taxes weren't brutal. They weren't, the colonists have been getting ripped off forever. It was the fact that they had no say so over it and they were being forced to do it. This is, uh, uh, this is what the colonists did, is there's a little spot on every legal document where you had to put the stamp, this little skull and crossbones, that was the, what the colonists did. It automatically on that, that's like if it's blank, it's the skull and crossbones. They're like, yeah, because it's, it's, a, it's a negative connotation to the stamp. Uh, but you had to put a stamp over the skull and crossbones for it to be legal. And there's no way of getting away from this. Uh, so the anger by the colonists, because they're being disrespected, because you know who doesn't have to pay a stamp act? Pay stamp taxes? Buy a stamp for stuff? People that actually live in England? They don't, they don't have to pay for any of this. And keep in mind, all of this is to pay off a war the colonists didn't even care about to begin with, because their lives weren't going to change. So hostilities grow. And this is where the famous idea or flag at the time, which had actually been created by Benjamin Franklin back in about 10 years before this, it becomes more popular now, is this join or die mentality. So this is a snake that's all cut up and each part of the snake is supposed to represent a specific colony. The idea, now any is New England, which is a collection of colonies in New York, New Jersey, uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, it's like a snake. If you cut it all off, it'll die. The only way the snake can survive is if it's all together. Now, you're, you might think it's interesting or odd that we would choose to represent ourselves as a snake, but there's a actually a pretty good argument for the, the whole don't tread on me that we'll talk about uh, in, in another unit on why that symbol is, is a good analogy for the colonies that the colonies choose for themselves. But from the beginning, the colonists realized we can't just be like individual colonies because that's literally what it was. Just individual, England owns these different colonies. They, we were all, meaning the colonists, we're all in this together. If you don't join together and make one cohesive group, one cohesive snake, then you're going to die. If, you, if we're divided, we die. So the, this whole drama over the taxes actually helps unite the colonists into a, a common ideal at the time of being one as opposed to being individual colonists. Uh, so the question here is why were the colonists furious over the new taxes? And we've talked about that here in detail. Why did England feel they're justified for paying these taxes? Well, the big reason here is the fact that England feels like the colonists should have to pay it because in England's mind, why'd they fight this war? To save the colonists from the evil French. It's not how the colonists felt. 
but that is how England felt. So England feels it's fully justifiable that the colonists are the only ones that have to pay this because we saved them from the evil French. Uh, so that is it, England's mentality, and they just don't get it. Why in the world would the colonists be so upset over this? And again, our issue is, is all about respect. All right, answer, uh, this completely pauses me, and we're moving on. All right, so we move up into 1770. Tensions have risen. So let me, we're going to talk about writs of assistance here. That sounds kind of boring, but it's not because it's a massive jerk move. So there were a lot of places in the New World who didn't really care about this whole situation at all. All right, and we'll talk about them. We get to Thomas Paine's Common Sense. We'll talk about, about how everybody kind of got on board. Places that were from the beginning actively furious over this entire situation were places like Boston. Boston, Massachusetts, biggest harbor in the New World. Uh, the people in Boston adamantly against these taxes because they, because you know, ships are coming and going all the time. They dealt directly with England all the time. So there's a lot of uh, uh, ruffian acts taking place. You know, people defacing stuff, beating up, uh, you know, British. There, there's there's some shady stuff taking place by the colonists in in, in uh, Boston 100%. So it becomes pretty obvious, and we'll talk about this in, in the next lesson. There starts being, uh, you know, a lot of the guns start to like seem to be disappearing. It's pretty obvious that people are like starting to stockpile guns or, uh, and we'll get to that in the next lesson. More importantly here, like, let's stick with the taxes here so I don't, I don't split off down to too many roads. There are people who are smuggling goods. They're selling stuff without a stamp on it. You know, people doing illegal stuff. And it's, it's a big enough issue that the British government wants to shut it down. Now, people are doing this out of their private homes. So what England does is writes this thing called the Writs of Assistance, which gives Anybody here that works for the British government, like the Red Coats, which is the military, that's supposed to be, you know, the colonist military too, they can go into your house and search and see if you're doing anything wrong without a warrant. Now, a warrant is when a judge says, okay, we think this person has something, whatever, like specific bad thing in their house, and you, there's enough evidence to guess that it does, so the judge will sign off and they can go raid your house and look for it and see if it's there. Writs of assistance is a blank slate written from England. Like, if you think they might, you just go on in there. So you can just raid anybody's house if you're a red coat and trash their stuff. And that's uh, what you know, pictures here of the red coats just raiding people's houses and, and taking over all their stuff, uh, looking for anything that might be considered contraband or negative. This really infuriates the colonists because it's an absolute violation of privacy. The reason that's important is because once, spoiler alert, America becomes its own country, we are very clear on what you have to have to go into somebody's private residence without their permission. Uh, and there's Supreme Court cases, we'll talk about a bunch in this course throughout different units of the what your privacy is and what the government has to prove in order to go look for illegal stuff coming into your private property. Because, and this goes back to, to the writs of assistance. Uh, just like the trial of John Peter Zinger, you can see that in our constitution today, that freedom of the press, writs of assistance, 100%. We have very clear writings in our constitution about warrants and what has to take place to enter somebody's residence without their permission. Uh, so this is happening in Boston. Everybody's really grumpy. Uh, their tensions are really high. And then something catastrophic happens that really ups the ante ups the tensions in Boston and the entire colonies against Britain. And it's going to happen on March 5th, 1770. Tensions have, for seven years have been rising in Boston. And this right here is a photograph in Boston present day of where this event took place. So let me walk you through pretty quickly here because it is worth giving some detail on what actually happens and the power of media 
even in the 1700s, because again, that's another part of this course. We'll talk about the power of the media. Uh, it was very powerful in the 1700s. So let's talk about what happened. So there will be red coats. Now here's a little drawing of red coat. They look like old men uh, because they got the, the powder wigs. They're usually 17, 18 years old. They're basically security that got sent over here from England to make sure Boston doesn't get out of hand. Needless to say, Boston uh, wasn't a big fan of these people over here. Even though it's technically their military to protect them, it started to feel this us versus them. Well, March 5th, 1770, a couple of these sentries, as they were called, just, just guards, uh, they were out outside a bar, uh, and a bunch of people were inside getting drunk at the bar, which there's quite a few American history stories that start with people getting drunk in a bar. And they go outside. It's, so it's March. It's in Boston. There's snow on the ground. All right. They go out and they start harassing these men. All right. They start throwing snowballs at them. Well, that doesn't seem very nice. They start harassing these men. Uh, the men get a little concerned uh, because, uh, you know, you literally have people throwing snowballs at you. That, that's not cool. Like, you have rifles and these get like 17 years old. Uh, uh, young men. So they call for backup down the alley. They, they, they see another group of soldiers coming by and they call for like backup like, hey, these guys are like drunk people are coming out here and start to harass us. So uh, more red coats show up and this is about how many red coats were there. Uh, so a lot of these men are rope makers, just happens to be. So they make rope. The way you make rope back then, because it's a harbor, so you need a lot of rope for ships. That's why rope is so important is you twist it and then you have these metal pieces that go in between the ropes as it twists and, you, and you're hitting it all day. So these guys are pretty muscular guys and they always have these clubs to beaten out rope, all right? So they, for whatever reason, I mean, it's in the middle of the night, these guys took their work clubs with them. So they have clubs, they're throwing snowballs. Then they start throwing oyster shells, all right? Uh, at the, the red coats. More people show up. Uh, one of the redcoats gets hit with the club and a big crowd gathers like taunting the redcoats. It starts getting really, really weird. Uh, as the crowd gets more and more hostile, the redcoats put their guns in firing position with the bayonets to keep them away. The commanding officer sees this, uh, Captain Preston. He actually goes in front of the guns because he wants to make sure that because this could get real ugly real quick, right? Because you have guys with guns and people with clubs and oyster shells. He goes and stands in front of them and says, do not fire, do not fire, do not fire. The drunk crowd responds with, oh, fire, fire, fire. They start screaming fire. They scream fire so much that the uh, surrounding area starts coming out of their homes and get water buckets thinking there's an actual fire. All right, because everybody's made of wood of one house to catch on fire. Everybody panics. There's no like fire station. Uh, everybody, so look, they were screaming fire so loud that people in surrounding areas were getting water buckets thinking there was an actual fire that needed to be put out with community help. One of the guys gets hit with a club and falls down. One of the uh, soldiers falls down and fires. Whether he fired at the guy or his gun went off accidentally, Still somewhat of a debate over that. Uh, but legally speaking, if he was hit with a club, he could have fired. And everybody knows he was hit with a club. He fired. He did not hit the guy that hit him with the club. Uh, and it fired into the crowd. When he fired, most of the soldiers, not all of them, most of the soldiers fired their weapons because they thought that's what was expected because they, it was so deafening that they fired their weapons. Five colonists are killed immediately and everybody scampers. All right. Captain Preston is like, oh, and turns around, marches his troops out like, you know, the, it, it is over. Everybody shows up. People are horrified by this. Uh, Captain Preston and all of his men are arrested for murder. All right. I'm, I'm going to jump around the story a little bit to explain this. He is arrested for murder of them. Uh, they go on trial for this. A local lawyer at the time named John Adams feels like in America, because I mean, they just want to execute all these red coats for firing on an unarmed, innocent crowd. They're like just walking by because that started to be the belief. And we'll talk about that. Uh, John Adams is going to defend him because he feels like in America, you have to have a functioning judicial system, which again is another pivotal part of our 
constitution, all right, uh, that we have will ha will eventually make. They end up proving the story that I just told you of the truth, and they are acquitted and sent back to England. John Adams was not very popular for defending these men, and literally to try to save his own career, really commits to the whole patriot idea, that whole idea that uh, the colonies need to be separate. And because of that, uh, he, he, he kind of gets wrapped up in the Revolutionary War and ends up being uh, the vice president under George Washington and then the second president of the United States. Uh, but he really came to fame for getting the Redcoats off for killing five colonists. Now, let's go back to the, where this happened. You have five people that have been killed. The whole city is, is outraged by this. Enter this man named Paul Revere. You may have heard of Paul Revere. He's got to go running through Lexington and Concourse and the British are coming, which again, not exactly what happened. And we'll talk about that in, in a, a future unit. Paul Revere is a printmaker. Basically, this is the guy who makes the pictures that go on the paper. He had to like carve it out, put ink on it, and then put it in, in the newspaper. That event that we just talked about where those five people got killed is a massive turning point in American history because of this man's ability to manipulate the media. Because these five people got killed, it was an awful situation, it was a very tense situation, you know, blame to go all around. But the newspaper doesn't present it that way. And the newspaper with the picture by Paul Revere is this. It is called The Bloody Massacre. It would eventually be called the Boston Massacre. Notice this picture versus the story I told you, which is the truth because it all went through a criminal trial. The, these people here, it's bright sunny day. These people are just look like they're walking to church. You're just murdering people. They're like, oh no, you got a puppy? A puppy, who doesn't love a puppy? The puppy's in, gun, in the middle of gunfire. Look at the evil red coat. Look where Captain Preston is. He is behind him with his sword up saying, fire, like ordering them to fire on unarmed uh, uh, people here. In the court, court case, in, in, at trial, 100% Captain, Pre Captain Preston almost got shot himself because they fired, he was in front of him. Because he was trying not to have this happen. It was, a it, was, it was a wild situation. However, none of the truth matters. What matters is what people believe. And people believe this is what happened based on this picture because this picture spreads throughout the entire colonies. From this point on, doesn't matter what actually happened. The Redcoats are vicious murderers. And that is the view of the Redcoats and absolutely changes the dynamic from we're squabbling with ourselves to a very much of a we, our entity, is squabbling with your entity. And there's a big gap between the British and the Redcoats and the colonists after uh, the media and this image of the Redcoats get, get spread out uh, across the colonies. So the question here is, what is the difference between what happened in the Boston Massacre and what was reported? How did the picture created by Paul Revere change the course of American history? Uh, we talked about that uh, there in depth. Uh, Paul's me answer that completely and uh, we're done. I will uh, see you guys tomorrow.